you will join me again to welcome barrister and make a one but give him a big god bless you as he comes Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we worship you because you do things that the mind of man cannot understand. We want to thank you because of what you have done already this morning. The salvation of so many people, the testimonies that have been so strong, the power of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of your word, the ways in which you have poured out your love upon us this morning. We want to thank you. The Almighty. The high and lofty one, the one who dwells in the high and lofty place, the eternal God, the only one who can lift up his right hand to heaven and declare, I live forever. The one who does not sleep, who does not slumber, who never gets tired. Jesus told us that you are stronger than all. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us. And thank you for blessing us. Lord, as we go forward this morning, we ask that you will take us from grace to grace, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Glorify your name now, Lord. We pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, please be seated. It's been so wonderful to just sit and watch God move. I mean, that altar call was supernatural. It just the spirit of god just switched on something i was sitting there and watching it and believe me i began to cry because you could you knew it was god you knew it was god you knew god switched something on and said it's time to save people and all of you young people who came forward god bless you uh there is a special word for you in the message here and I'm hoping that the Spirit of God will help you get it. Please open with me your Bibles to the book of Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. There is a way the word that God laid on my heart would dovetail into what we saw just now. And so those of you who came forward, please listen very carefully. Remember last night, we began to speak of exercising authority through the courts of heaven. And we looked a little bit at the keys of the kingdom, the promise that Jesus made and said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And we explore the fact that it's a judicial process that Jesus was speaking about. We looked at Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 where Jesus said that he had come to proclaim liberty to the captives and to open the prison doors to them that are bound. We understood that it takes a judicial process to get somebody in prison. And it will have to take a judicial process to bring somebody out. We looked at Daniel chapter 7 and we saw the scene in heaven 
when the court in heaven would sit. The books would be opened and so on. And we looked a little at the fact that when you look at one of the keys, the keys of death and of hell, uh, you use those keys when you're dealing with very, very strong national uh, issues. And I gave you the testimony of what happened in Ethiopia uh, some years ago. Now this morning, I want us to look at the, a little more practical uh, demonstration of what really happens when you go to the court of heaven. And I want to thank Pastor David for the way he, by the Holy Spirit, emphasized the matter of repentance, repentance, repentance uh, this morning. Actually, repentance is the first alphabet in intercession. And it is the first alphabet when you begin to deal with God. Jesus came and he said, repent. John the Baptist before him came and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came and said, the kingdom of heaven has come. Repent. Now let's look at Judges chapter 11. This is the story of a man called Jephthah. Now Jephthah the Gideonite was a mighty man of valor. What is the next phrase that we see there? Please let's all read it together. One, two, go. But he was the son of a harlot and Gilead begot Jephthah. He was a mighty man of valor, but Naaman was a mighty man, a Syrian army general, but he was a leper. In the case here, this one was the son of a harlot. And in the scriptures, even in normal life, you don't normally put on your CV, I'm the son of a harlot. You don't you don't even want people to know about that. But this is the case of this man. Now look at what happened. Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and look at the kind of people that came to him. The Bible says, And worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. These were worthless men, bandits, thugs, whatever you choose to call them. They came together and they went raiding. They would go kill people, steal things, plunder. This was the kind of man that we're talking about this morning. Now, God is very gracious. This man was a societal reject. He was, I mean, what else would you say? His brothers chased him out of his inheritance, of the family. They cut him off. They said, you don't belong here. You're the son of another woman. You're not even going to get any bit of the property. Go. It came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Then they said to Jephthah, come and be our commander that we may fight against the people of Ammon. Now, the story begins to change here. Very dramatically. A mighty man of valor. Societally he was out. But when there was a problem in the land. The elders no less. The elders. The elders. Everybody say the elders. The elders went and spoke to this man. Come. Not just come and uh, help us. But come and be commander over us. They came with a proposal. And the proposal involved pardon, restoration, 
redemption, if you like. This man who was not worthy of anything, the need had arisen and the elders went and said, come and be commander over us. I want you to think about that. You see, no matter where you have been, no matter what you have done, Jesus, like we've just been reminded, we've been told, especially this weekend around the world, Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins, to reconcile us to God, to make us accepted in the beloved, and to restore us, to bring us back, and to make us kings and priests. In this story, this man, Jephthah, was restored. The elders went to him and they said, come and be commander over us, that we may fight against the people of Ammon. Now look at verse 7. You see, this man's insecurity was showing. And there was a question that uh, Pastor David asked some minutes ago with tears in his eyes and with weeping in his voice. He said, let's ask this question. Does Jesus actually save? And he said, let's get evidence. And he began to call people out. Notice that here in verse 7, So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. This man was driving a hard bargain. Verse 9, So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon, and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. This is important. It's not enough to get the assurances of men. Jephthah, after agreement, after making sure that he understood what they were discussing uh, in law, uh, before you have a contract, one of the conditions has to be a meeting of the minds. Uh, they call it in Latin consensus ad idem. Consensus ad idem. You make sure you understand what this man is saying and he makes sure he, you understand what you're saying, what you mean to say, what you mean by the words you say. When they got to that point, Jephthah took all the words and spoke them to the Lord. They brought the Lord into the covenant. They brought the Lord into the agreement. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them, and so on. Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon, saying, This is where the story takes another turn. You see, Jephthah had now been installed as commander, as leader, as the bona fide representative of the people of Israel. A transformation. And as a believer, as a Christian, when you are saved, when you are born again, when your sins have been forgiven, when you are cleansed, your position changes. You are made, 1 Peter 2.9, a priest and a king. Revelation 1.5, Jesus has washed us from our sins in his own blood 
and has made us priests and kings and we shall reign on the earth. Priests and kings exercise responsibility in behalf of society, in behalf of others. Now this man has assumed responsibility on behalf of the people. And one of the responsibilities we have is intercession. Paul says that we should give thanks, make supplications, make intercessions for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. He says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men come to the knowledge of the truth. So we come to this responsibility. And I want to say to you this morning, if you have not entered into the place where you exercise this responsibility, you need to take this responsibility now. It's important that you understand that when you become a believer, you automatically need to become an intercessor. That responsibility is presented to us. And this man, Jephthah, now is going to plead the case of the entire nation of Israel. This man who was rejected, this man who was driven out, this man who was banding around with uh, troublesome people, his status, his position had changed. He now had the responsibility to represent the people before, you know, I mean, uh, in this matter of the warfare. Now, if you look at what the man said, first of all, in verse 12, now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon, saying, what do you have against me that you have come to fight against me in my land? Can you, can you, can you, do you understand this man speaking now on behalf of everybody in the first person singular? Hello, are you there? Are you with me? This man who now was exercising authority, he sent a message to the king of Ammon. He says, what do you have against me? Why are you coming to fight against me? Why does he use the word me? Of course, because he was speaking in behalf of the entire nation of Israel. Now, I want you to understand this because you see, when you appear for people in court, you take on their case, you take on their liabilities, you take on their assets, and you can talk like this. You make submissions in behalf of your clients. Now, but more to the point, listen carefully. This man sent a message to the king that had besieged them and said, why are you making war against me? Now, please, let us look at the next principle. Look at this. And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from the Anon as far as the Jabbok and to the Jordan, now therefore restore those lands peaceably. The opposing king made some statements. He stated some facts. He accused Israel of taking his land and he wants the land supposedly taken from them to be restored peaceably. Look at verse 14. This is the back and forth in this case. And Jephthah was speaking. So Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon and said to him, thus says Jephthah. Now look at the pleadings. Look at the statements. Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. For when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, Please, let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not heed. And in like manner, they sent to the king of Moab. But he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh. And they went along through the wilderness and uh, bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab came to the east side of the land of Moab and encamped on the other side of the Anon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Anon was the border of Moab. 
Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please, let us pass through your land into our place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and camped in Jehaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel. And they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Anon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. Now, now please look up. I read that to prove two principles. One, when you are representing people, family, community, city, nation before the Lord, you need to immerse yourself and soak yourself in the facts of the matter that you're dealing with. You would notice that Jephthah was reciting the history of the journey of the children of Israel. The other party said, you dispossessed me of my land. Return it to me peaceably. And Jephthah was saying, no, 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 no. This is what happened. This is how the children of Israel moved. When they got here, they sent messengers to the king then. And the king refused. So they went this way and so on and so forth. They got to the border of another nation and this is what happened. Now, listen, God is a God of truth. God is a God of righteousness. In Psalm 89 verse 14 and Psalm 97 verse 2, the Bible says righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So, if you're dealing with God, if you're saying something before the Lord, then it has to be correct. So, we need to take the pains. This is where the hard work comes in. To find out the facts and make sure that in making our presentation before God, we are saying exactly what is right. Say amen, somebody. Jephthah, this is an illustration. Jephthah took time to find out the correct history of what happened. Because you will soon see that what God did later bore out this. Now look at verse 23. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. Should you then possess it? This piece of evidence is very crucial. He says, look, you said we dispossessed you. No, that's not correct. It was God who dispossessed you and gave it to us. And he's done something else. In addition to contradicting what the king of Ammon said, he had now brought God into the matter. He had made God part of the case. He had made God, if you like, a witness in the matter. He had made God an interested party in the matter. But this is important. I said it last night and I'm going to you know, keep hammering on it. When you come before God, find a way to honestly make God part of the matter. Say amen, somebody. Show him how his interest, his name, is going to be enhanced or, if you like, denigrated, depending on the way the matter, you know, would present itself. It's important. Now, notice here, verse 24. Let's look at verse 24. Will you not possess whatever Chemosh your God gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord our God takes possession of before us, we will possess. Look at this argument. And I want you to understand the principle. Well, we worship God. And God gives us this and we possess it. You worship Chemosh. Why don't you take whatever Chemosh gives you? Why? Why would you want to take what our God, you know, gives to us? It's a very serious argument because if you understand this, in the realm of the spirit, when you're presenting your case before God and you are challenging, if you like, the powers of darkness, the enemy is also a very legal spirit. He knows when you're speaking the truth. Now, look at this. 
Will you not possess whatever chemos your God gives you to possess? So, whatever the Lord our God uh, takes possession of before us will possess. And now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? Questions that the other party needs to answer. If you like, cross-examination. While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and his villages, in Aru and his villages, and in all the cities of the, along the banks of the Anon, for 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? If you say that the land belongs to you, Israel has been living here for 300 years. Why did you not recover the land during that period? And one of the defenses in law is the defense of acquiescence. In other words, for 300 years, you've been sleeping on your rights. If the land truly belonged to you, why haven't you recovered it in 300 years? Serious evidence. If for the last 300 years, we've uh, worshipped here, we've done everything here, and then suddenly, 300 years down the road, you saw this piece of land belongs to us. What were you doing sleeping on your rights for 300 years? Do you understand my question? Yes. Now, verse 27. Therefore, look at his conclusion at the end of his submission. Therefore, I have not sinned against you. But you wrong me by fighting against me. Now, please, let's all read verse 27 together with a loud voice. Please, everybody, verse 27. One, two, go. Therefore, I have not sinned against you, but you wrong me by fighting against me. A little louder. No, no, no. A little louder now. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. You see where he had brought the case. After stating the facts, disputing what the other party had said, asking them questions they couldn't answer, then he brought the real thing down and said, for 300 years, 300 years, you have done nothing. We've been sitting in this land. Then he pushed it. He said, now, may the Lord, the judge, Render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. However, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent him. Now, let's look at verse 29. See the response from heaven. See the response from God. Now, let's look at where the verdict went and what God did. Let's all read verse 29 together. One, two, go. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. Now let's go back again. A little louder, a little louder. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Stop there. You see, this was God's response. I've listened to you state your case. You've uh, given clear evidence. The other side had no answer to what you laid out. And you even made me a part of the case because you said it was me who dispossessed those people and gave you the land. And you've been occupying it for the last 300 years. And then you invited me as judge. What do I do? God now poured out the spirit upon Jephthah. Say amen, somebody. Now the spirit this time was to give Jephthah wisdom, courage, boldness, power, strategy to execute the verdict of heaven. And look at what the Spirit enabled Jephthah to do. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he advanced towards the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and so on and so forth. Now, look at verse 32. So Jephthah advanced towards the people of Ammon to fight against them. And what happened? And the Lord delivered them into his hands. Let's read verse 32 together, everybody. One, two, go. So Jephthah advanced towards the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hand. Now look at the results. Verse 33. And he defeated them from Aroah as far as beneath 20 cities. Look at that. And to Ebel uh, Keramim, 
with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were what? Subdued before the children of Israel. Subdued. Defeated, subdued. Now, let me reiterate the principle we started with yesterday night. You need to win the battle in the court of heaven before you go to the battlefield. Now, spiritual warfare is biblical. Wonderful. We've learned it. We know it. But please, listen. It is important that you bring your matter into the court of God and get the verdict there. So that when you now begin spiritual warfare, you'll just be running over the enemy. Say amen, somebody. Um, let me just quickly share one important story that um, <laughs> we all uh, have learned from Sunday school. You notice that David, when David came to the battlefield, David didn't immediately go to fight Goliath. He asked a few questions. He asked the question, he said, what would be done to the man who uh, kills this uncircumcised Philistine? And he brought two charges, if you notice, two charges, very quickly, before the Lord in the court of heaven, very quickly. First of all, he said, this man has reproached the armies of, of the living God. In other words, by reproaching the armies of the living God, this man had reproached God himself. And when you tell God, this man has reproached your name, the implication is that this man is behaving as if you do not exist. And you happen to be the Lord God of hosts. You are the God of the nation of Israel. And if this man is reproaching the entire army, he's also reproaching you. Hello? That's what David did. And by bringing those two charges against Goliath, just before he went off to see uh, Saul, he raised the ante a bit. Then he made a statement. He brought evidence. He said, the God who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, he will uh, deliver me also today. And this uncircumcised Philistine will die like this uh, lion and watching. And this thing was happening between heaven and David. Now look at me. Look, listen to me. David now began to move. Uh, Goliath looked at him and said this one is too young, too small what is this? cast him by his gods and David took off now the moment David let loose the first stone I can assure you this was a man 9 feet 4 inches tall dressed in all of this armor but God from the foundation of the world had reserved one little spot on his forehead that was not covered with anything from the foundation of the world. And when he let loose that stone, I am sure that the angel of the Lord around that battlefield must have been given the instruction. Give this stone propulsion. Give it direction. Make sure that it hits that spot. And make sure that when it hits, you only need one stone. You don't need any more. The judgment nine feet four inches this man fell and david who was told by the holy spirit the judgment was you cut off his head and he has a sword so use it look at the irony you tell somebody i'm going to cut off your head but you didn't tell him i'm going to use your sword to do so so david runs and jumps on top of this man mountain pulls his sword and uh, cuts off his head now you know what God did? The anointing that David was carrying, plus the verdict, moved backwards over to the children of Israel that had been imprisoned for 40 days. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to open what? The prison doors to them that had been for 40 days they've been bound in prison. And because that judgment had been obtained, the man now had the key 
And that anointing went backwards, opened the prison doors, and the army of Israel suddenly found their voices and found their feet. Instead of running away, they had been doing in the last 40 days, they now began to chase the uh, Philistine army. And they became, if you like, instruments to fulfill the prophecy. Notice that if you read that story, the last sentence that David made, he says, and God will deliver you into our plural hands. And that was when he included the children of Israel. They went. Now, the spirit of fear that had left the children of Israel moved across the battlefield and now gripped the Philistines. And they did what? They began to run. It was now their time to run. It was now their turn to run. And the killing began to take place. When the killing began, the birds of the air that had been flying all over the place now began to see all sorts of human beings falling down. And they began to come down to uh, eat a supper, lunch, and uh, dinner, and all of that. Now, listen. David took the head of uh, Goliath. He had said, I will take your head from you. All the other things the rest of the people can take. I just want the head of uh, Goliath. He took the sword. Now, his oldest brother, Eliab, uh, just before the battle started, had said, you little proud boy, I know you. You have come to see the battle. Where are those few sheep that you're supposed to be looking at, looking after? All the accusations wrong. Now, look at me. You see, when you are arguing a case before God, do not allow anything that will distract you. Forget about distractions. You see, because if David had listened to his senior brother, and those of you who come from some of these families where there are a, number, a lot of boys, you know how it is. If the older boys don't like you and you're the younger one, just like in the case of Joseph, you might get hurt. And if David had pursued that argument, the story would have been, the newspapers would have said there was a problem in the, uh, amongst the children of Jesse yesterday uh, on the battlefield and they fought one another and all sorts of things. I don't know how they would have framed the story because it didn't happen. But notice that David just didn't pay attention. The only thing he said is there not a reason and he went on and finished the matter. Now, like I was saying, when he came with the head of Saul, I mean the head of Goliath, I don't know what the conversation was between him and Elia. Would you have a guess? Huh? Do you understand what I'm saying? The brother who said, what are you doing here, you little boy? What are you doing here? What are those few sheep you're supposed to be looking after? I know, you know, you've come to watch the battle. Now, that man had been running for 40 days from this man and his little brother who was not old enough to be in the army was carrying the head of Goliath and holding his sword. The principle there is this. If you know how to plead in the court of heaven quite a few times you will bring back results that had defied previous generations. You will solve matters that have defied others. You don't bother what they're saying. Just transact with God. And if God gives you the verdict and he wants you to execute it, do so. Now God had removed the reproach of Israel. And there was something that David also said. He said that the whole world may know that there is a God in Israel. It wasn't a question of one small local battlefield. No. That the whole world may know. And that the people here will know that God does not save by the sword or the spear. So eight prophecies as the result of the verdict that came. And the transaction between God and uh, David in the court of heaven. Say amen somebody. Now I want you to understand two more things before I wind down. Please remember Pastor David said repentance 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 he told us what repentance was not he taught us about uh, false repentance and how it is that it starts from the heart it then proceeds from the mouth and then you take action you turn 180 degrees change direction how many of you remember that let me see your hands 
please never forget. Never forget. That is what you must do to make sure that when you come and you're going into the presence of God, Satan cannot accuse you of anything. If he tries, it will not stick. Eliab, David's oldest brother, tried to accuse him. What are those few sheep that you're supposed to be looking at? I know you are proud. I know you have come to observe the battle. None of them was correct. None of it stuck. David didn't mind and he went about and did the business. Say amen somebody. Please bear that in mind. Please bear that in mind. You must know your facts. What was, the, what was the important fact here? This man was an uncircumcised Philistine. But David knew his God. That God was actually the commander of this army. That he, having now been anointed, he was the de facto king of the people. And that Goliath was in error. Goliath may, got it wrong. The people were not the servants of Saul. They were the servants of David. And that man was taking too much on himself. When he said he wanted to direct the cause of the battle, the Lord of hosts had that right. And David pointed it out to him, you're going too far. The verdict was, this one is the Lord's battle. I come against you in the name of the Lord. It's not because you are a fantastic whatever or whoever. It is simply because God has given you authority and has given you the anointing. And you must make it count every time. Say amen somebody. Now when you get the verdict don't rub it in don't uh, uh the foreigners who are here please forgive me i'm just going to do something that only the people who come from nigeria here will understand but you might as well watch you see when we were little if you won an argument or you bested somebody if you want the whatever it is to actually pain the person some more you did this. You see everybody's laughing. In other words, I wanted to pain you some more. Now, David didn't go doing that with his brothers. Hello? He didn't do that. He, the people who actually praised David were not on the battlefield. The women who didn't attend the uh, battle were the ones who began to sing that Saul had killed his uh, thousands and David is how many? 10,000. Ah, Saul got mad, got jealous. So leave the taunting and all the other things to other people. Just move on to the next uh, assignment. You see, let me not leave out two illustrations, two examples of women it's not just men who can bring cases before the court of heaven. In the book of Numbers, there was this story about the five daughters of Zelophehad. Five of them. There was no brother in their lineage. The father had died and he had no sons. And they were still in the wilderness. And Moses had laid out the law about the matter of inheriting land. And it was... If the man had no sons, then all the land went to the brothers. And the daughters of Zilophi had five of them. They came to uh, Moses, the elders, the priests, the whole court, if you like. And they had the courage. And they had the, you know, if you like, the boldness to say, Moses, this is what you said God said. But our father did not die in the rebellion of Korah. He died in his own sins. He had no son. If we follow what you have just said, it means that all our father's inheritance will leave the family. And Moses said, give me time. I will talk to God and I will bring a verdict. Moses went to plead the matter, lay it out before God. And God said, what the daughters of Zelophi had have said is uh, right. Give them the land. What will happen is make sure that they marry their cousins and so that the land will remain in the family it became a matter of appeal later and clarification but they had got justice and in the book of second kings there was another case involving a woman the widow whose son elisha raised from the dead after seven years of famine 
she wasn't in the country. Elisha had warned her there was going to be famine, so go into another country. When the famine had subsided, she came back and came to the king and said, my land, my farm, all the things are left behind. Please, can you restore? Everybody say restore. Restore. Can you restore them? Incidentally, the day she was making her report, if you like, bringing her case before the king, Gehizai, the former servant of uh, Elisha, was in the palace. And then Elisha, I mean, sorry, Gehizai said, oh, this is the widow whose son uh, Elisha raised from the dead. Really? She had this, she did this, she did that. The king instructed an officer, take this woman, restore the land, restore the farms, and restore the profits from every produce that had been sold from the farm. The woman got uh, justice. What is the application? You shouldn't overuse this. I must warn you. But you see, there are certain family issues, there are certain family problems which you can rightly bring before the Lord and get justice, get restoration, and get clarification. It's important because when you sort it out there, and the Spirit of God tells you what the verdict is, you will always be right. Say amen, somebody. But let's take it a little further. Now, many of you here are women, young women, middle-aged women, some few elderly women, and quite a lot of you look properly educated, quite a lot of you. What about considering this? There are lots of widows, lots of widows, in our society, tribes, communities, local governments. Now that you know this principle, what if you volunteered, took on the extra job of researching the traditional and cultural laws that are used in our society to oppress widows, to deny them inheritance, and you know, remove from them what their husbands and, you know, uh, yes, their husbands should have left for them, or rather left for them. They and their sons now have nothing because the moment the man dies, the relatives go after everything, money, lands, houses, and so on and so forth. Why don't you begin the process of researching these laws and seeing how repugnant they are? Check what the laws of succession would be in various parts of Nigeria and begin to either mediate in the community on their behalf or make advocacy in the courts. Maybe pro bono without charges or maybe with token charges and begin to make sure that they get justice. What about doing that? That's a challenge for all of our women who are educated, you are, you don't have to be a lawyer. You may even have to engage female Christian lawyers and male Christian lawyers. Let that be part of their job, you know, to use their professions in that area to serve society. Say amen, somebody. It's something that we can do so that we would make sure that the widows in our society, they don't have to be members of your church they do get justice and they have inheritance restored to them. Let me finish. There was this testimony. A man, an Assemblies of God man died and his brother took over the lands of this man and quite a lot of his property from the widow. And the widow came to this brother, this brother-in-law and pleaded and said, please, you know my husband serve the Lord. He didn't have much. What he left for us, me and the children would need those uh, lands to look after ourselves. And the brother-in-law dismissed it. You know what she did? Look at me. She went before the Lord, lifted up her hands and said, Lord, this man has taken over my husband's inheritance and has refused to release them to me and the children. Lord, you be the judge. This brother-in-law 
rolled his bicycle near the edge of a river that runs by the community to wash it ostensibly of mud. Nobody knows how he fell into the river and drowned. Now, the serious aspect of the story was that for three days, nobody saw his body. Such parties went out looking for the corpse of this man. Then, the other half of the family went to a sorcerer who checked through divination. And the spirit world answered and said, this man's body should not have been refloated, but his head belongs to one particular spirit. And those of you who come from the east would know there's a spirit that people worship there and the first sons, the, when the first son would die, they would be buried at midnight and a pot would be put over the head. After one year, when the skull falls into the pot, it is exhumed, cleaned out, prepared, and worshipped. Divination, the spirit said, the head belongs to that spirit, and the body, the remaining trunk, belongs to the water spirit. So, the body will be refloated, but the head will be given to that other spirit, and the body will have to be buried by the river. That's how this inheritance snatcher ended up. Now, can you imagine if you come from such a family and you have to deal with that kind of a thing, you will need to know the scriptures. You would need to know what Jesus did on the cross. You would need to really bring repentance on behalf of the family to deal with that kind of stuff. Which brings us back to what Pastor David said. Please, I want to close by Pleading with you, when you're dealing with such family foundations, you need to bring quality, factual, honest, deep, unpretentious repentance so that the door of mercy can open, the door of grace can open, God can come into the matter, the foundation of what Satan laid in that place can be removed, and then you can begin to see your way to uh, sort this matter out. Say amen, somebody. Can you stand for a moment? Let me pray and then we'll finish. We want to pray now. I'm going to be praying simultaneously. One prayer after another, just two prayers. If you feel like a Jephthah, rejected, out of sorts, you don't know what is going on with you, but... Jesus has touched you today especially those of you who have given your life to Christ today and some of us who yes we're saved but we don't know what God wants us to do today I want you to receive the responsibility of becoming an intercessor somebody who prays for the city who prays for the community who prays for the nation that call is going forth this morning. Now that Jesus has reconciled you to the Father, Jephthah was restored. He was brought in. He was given responsibility. Now that you're a priest and you're a king, I want you to put up your hand and say, Lord, this Good Friday, I want to become an intercessor. If you want to become an intercessor, I don't want you to come forward. We don't have the time for that. Just put up your hand and I will pray for you. Lord, give me the help to be an intercessor. Give me the strength, the patience to gather facts so that I can bring matters concerning my family, my people, my community, my tribe, this nation, my city, the department where I work, the organization where I work. I want the anointing by the power of the Holy Spirit to pray for them, to intercede for them, to bring their matter before you. Let me see you put up your hand. Let me see your hand up there and I'll pray for you. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all of these ones who have lifted up their hands. Lord Jesus, you are our great high priest. You are holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. And you ever live to make intercession for us, to save us unto the uttermost, we who have come to God by you. This morning, this moment, release by the Holy Spirit the anointing of intercession, the anointing to become an intercessor, the compassion, the heart to become an intercessor, the understanding in the scriptures to become an intercessor upon all of these ones. Open their hearts. These ones who have lifted up their hands, begin to teach them Holy Spirit. Begin to instruct them. Begin to guide them. Begin to help them to become intercessors for their families, for their communities, for their cities, for their organizations, and for their nations. And let this grow and grow and grow and increase until they become mighty men and women of prayer. Let the anointing come upon them now. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Alright, put down your hand. We're still praying. If you want to volunteer, to actually begin to do what I suggested for widows, for women, widows, in, there are so many of them in our communities so that they can receive their inheritance which relatives and families have robbed them of if you want to get involved in that and you want to begin to do that please just lift up your hand and I will pray for you you necessarily don't have to be a lawyer you can engage lawyers on their behalf but this heart to pray for them this heart to see them receive the restoration of what rightly should be theirs and their children lift up your hands father in the name of jesus we want to ask for the heart of compassion for the opportunity for the boldness for the meekness for the humility for the love to take up the burden of widows who have been dispossessed of their inheritance. Lord, give these ones the anointing, the means to begin to find ways of making sure that these ones receive the restoration that they rightly deserve. Thank you as you do this. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Alright, please sit down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Project that Numbers chapter 27, verse 7. When he was teaching, I was counting of four stages of sharing inheritance. Numbers, what's the judgment? Go to where the answer was given. You shall speak to the children of Israel and said, If a man dies and has no son, then shall you cause the inheritance to pass to the daughters. So look at the four stages. A man dies. The inheritance go to the sons that's first stage if he has no sons second stage the inheritance should go to the daughters in africa we take it away from the girls and give it to uncles so look at the third stage this is what we need to help this is god's judgment this is the court of heaven the ruling that came from heaven look at the third stage if he has no daughters then you give the inheritance to his brothers, the brothers of the man that died. That means the person that should have been the uncle to the children. So the only time you can talk about uncles is no sons and no daughters. Then to make sure that the inheritance is not lost, he goes to the dead man's brothers. Okay, fourth stage. Yes, if his father had no brothers, then give the inheritance to the relatives closest to him in his family the nearest king's man and he shall possess it and this shall become a statue of judgment for the children of israel so four stages so relatives or community have no right coming to discuss a man's property just because he's dead 
They have no right there. And maybe you, you got involved, helped to oppress some widows, collected their land. Go ahead and return it. If you are the one dead, will you like that to happen to your wife or your children? Go ahead and return it as part of what is called repentance and restoration. Return it to the family that owns it. Amen. And then I personally, by understanding God's mind, have also found out that a man in writing a will can give not only to your sons, you can also give part of the will to your daughters. Thanks for listening to this message. Be sure to visit dominioncity.cc for other exciting new content from Dominion City or call us on 90 6957 8629 God bless you.